Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of 805 Inspires, where we look behind the scenes at museums and gardens. Today we have a fascinating journey and look into the history of Casa del Herrero. Jessica Tate, Executive Director, joins us to talk about uh, the gardens, the history, and uh, the preservation aspects of Casa del Herrero. I hope you enjoy this episode of 805 Inspires. Well, welcome to another edition of 805 Inspires. I'm Eric Davis, Executive Director of TV Santa Barbara. And in these fascinating series, we're taking a look at museums. Um, and today we have a great organization uh, to look at, Casa del Herrero. We're joined by Jessica Tade, Executive Director. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much for having me today. Why don't you give us a little introduction to your organization? So George Fox and Carrie Stedman uh, purchased land to build Casa del Herrero in the 1920s. And now all of these years later, it's actually a historic house museum located on 11 acres here in Montecito. Um, it's kind of a triple threat. <laughs> it's a beautiful historic uh, main house, a historic piece of architecture designed by George Washington Smith. And then inside the house, we actually have a wonderful art collection that the Stedmans collected from dating from about 15th, 16th century Spain. And then in addition to that, the house is surrounded by beautiful gardens, all designed by Ralph Stevens, Lockwood de Forest, and Francis T. Underhill. And so today, actually, Casa del Herr is the only national historic landmark in Montecito, and one of the, one of probably the best examples of Spanish revival architecture in America. Now, you, you, you mentioned a few names that I know pretty well, George Washington Smith, Lockwood de Forest. Tell us about the, some of the contributors to this. So yeah, I'll start with George Fox and Carrie Stedman. Uh, as I said, they purchased the house in, in the 1920s. They were originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and they started coming to Santa Barbara because Mr. St or George or Mr. Stedman's brother was being treated for diabetes by Mr. Sansom, now of Sansom Clinic fame. So they started coming to Santa Barbara and they really fell in love with the community. They thought it was a great place and so they decided to uh, purchase land and, and build Casa del Herrero. And it's really interesting because, it, you know, the, the house is being constructed. Uh, George worked with George Washington Smith. And uh, as it was being constructed, it was right around the time of the great Santa Barbara earthquake. And so George Fox Stedman was actually in town. He was staying at a local hotel, which was totally destroyed. And he raced up here thinking, you know, Casa del Herrero maybe had met the same fate. And he was thrilled to see when he got up here that the house was completely fine. So he actually moved into Casa del Herrero the day of the great earthquake, if you can believe it. And then after that, the rest of the family followed. So kind of an interesting connection to the history. So George Fox and Carrie were really creative individuals and really interesting people. George Fox was kind of like a Renaissance man, if you will, kind of like a modern day one. He was very interested in winemaking and he became an artist of silversmith. And so, during his time at Casa del Herrero, he really, um, he really invested in kind of being creative and creative pursuits. And you can see that all throughout the estate. I'm actually sitting in George Fox's workshop right now, as you can see behind me. And it was just this great place where he made really interesting pieces of silver. And then kind of underneath the workshop is actually where his wine cellar was. And he worked um, kind of as like an amateur winemaker trying to make to make wine. And I think the first couple of years it was a little rough, but eventually he made um, bottles that I think he felt were, were pretty good and he uh, was very happy to be able to engage in that process. And Carrie was also very creative. She loved flowers, loved flower arranging, often won awards for her flowers. And so the estate is full of her favorite flowers, especially camellias and roses. So, you know, the coming to Casa del Herrera, you really get a sense of these two really creative individuals who lived here. And you know, at first they started coming just in the summer. Um, they really enjoyed it, but eventually they decided to live here full time, which is what they did um, until both of their passings, Mr. Stedman in 1940 and then uh, Carrie in the 1960s. Tell me this, you, this uh, Casa del Herrero has been given landmark status. Is that correct? Uh-huh, we are the only national historic landmark um, in Montecito. That's amazing. And that workshop behind you is really fascinating. But what I, what I think about is the grounds and the, and the, the building itself. 
um, from that historic perspective. Tell us about the grounds and, and the and the um, the casa itself. So it's really interesting, actually. Uh, when Mr. and Mrs. Stedman decided they wanted to build a home here in Montecito, you know, they were really interested in the work of George Washington Smith. And actually, George Washington Smith is a really interesting person because originally he was interested in painting. And so he studied painting before going to Harvard to study architecture. You know, and he never graduated and he kind of became a draftsman. And then from there, he started uh, working in the bond market. And he made enough money doing that where he could sort of leave that job and become a painter full time. So that was really, I think, his first interest or his first love was painting. And he was doing that. And he eventually moved to, uh, to Santa Barbara. He eventually kind of came to Santa Barbara and decided to move here. And he purchased a piece of land and he designed and built a house very similar to houses um, like farmhouse style houses he had seen in Andalusia in Spain. And it's really interesting because that design was such a huge success. And people, I mean, really loved it that he all of a sudden had a lot of demand uh, for people wanting designs in a similar style. And so he became an architect full time, you know, doing this, this style of house. And so that's how uh, George and Carrie kind of came uh, to connect with him because they wanted a house in that style as well. And so they began working together. And, it, and it's funny because it's kind of like the tale of two Georges. Um, in that, you know, Mr. Selkall and Mr. Stedman, you know, George Fox Stedman, you know, he really had a lot of opinions and ideas about how Casa del Herrero should come together and how it should be designed. And so he would exchange letters with uh, George Washington Smith. And so, you know, you can read in their letters. It's really interesting because uh, George Washington Smith will say something and then George Fox Stedman will say something like, yeah, that's great, but here's what I'd like to, you know, this is what I'd like to see. And so, Together, they really worked on it. And, you know, in the end, it became this beautiful collaboration of Spanish revival architecture. Um, yeah, so it's really, it's really quite a fascinating place to visit. Incredible history. And tell us a little bit about when did it become a museum and during normal times, you know, how does a museum operate? So the Stedman family lived in the house. Uh, yeah, like I said, Mr. Stedman until his passing, Mrs. Stedman until her passing. And then after that, uh, their daughter actually lived in the house until about the late 1980s. And then at that point, when she passed away, it was her wish that Casa del Herrera would be given to the community. And so her son, George Stedman Bass, who was such a kind and wonderful, smart, caring individual, you know, he really worked on stewarding his mother's wishes. And so he was the one who began the process of turning the Casa into a nonprofit organization for the community. And so that process took a little time, but eventually we became a nonprofit in, in 1993. And, you know, it's really important, I think, that the, the family felt this need to, to preserve the CASA because the Stedman family is such an integral part of the fabric of the history of the community. So I think it's really wonderful that they, that they were able to do this and turn um, the house into a historic house museum. And so under normal conditions, which we're sort of returning to, a little bit here and there. Um, we are open uh, for guided tour only uh, on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And you just book a tour by going to casadelherrera.com and making a reservation. We don't have any tours posted right now, but within the next couple of weeks, we will be posting tours so people can come and visit us once again. And it's a 90 minute tour. You get to go inside the house, um, see the art collection, see the rooms. And then you also get to go into the beautiful garden spaces. And it's really a nice treat because the gardens are also very unique. Um, of course, Mr. Stedman, you know, had his hand in the design of the gardens as well. And they're like these really beautiful garden rooms. Each space is very different. Uh, we have what we call our blue and white garden, which has just beautiful you know, flowers, white, um, shades of blues and purples. Um, apparently the Stedmans like to look at that garden under the moonlight, which is kind of neat. Uh, we have a beautiful rose garden, which is one of Mrs. Stedman's favorite uh, flowers, as I mentioned. We also have um, orchards and also a really terrific Arizona garden, which is actually a cactus garden. Um, and so that's a beautiful space to be in. We have an herb garden, a cutting garden. We do flower arrangements every week. We have fabulous volunteers who come and do them. And they pull flowers right from, from the estate, from our cutting garden and from kind of the surrounding uh, area of the estate and they just put together the most beautiful flowers so it's almost as if 
you know, the Stedmans are still here, uh, just going about their day-to-day -day lives. Really neat. Uh, I'm going to come and take a tour. Um, we were filming this during the pandemic. Um, how have you adjusted and what, what's it been like navigating uh, a museum through this? You know, we're doing, I think, what most people are doing. Uh, we're just trying to be supportive of our staff. I have a wonderful board who's really involved and we're just all trying to move forward and, you know, in the, in the best way that we can. So we have some staff working from home, working remotely, um, but everybody's still engaged in our mission of preservation, which is wonderful. So, you know, the house is really, you know, all the garden spaces are still looking terrific and, you know, we're still, we're still committed to that mission, which I think is really wonderful. You talked about preservation. How is that handled? Is it done through archiving? Is it, uh, uh, talk a little bit about the preservation aspect. So I'm sure, as, as you all know, um, with any house, their <laughs> repairs become necessary over time. And that's definitely the case, especially with a historic home. We're approaching, you know, nearly 100 years old. So, you know, that's always at the forefront of everything we do, just keeping preservation top of mind. Um, it's especially important because, you know, the house's historic architecture and also an important characteristic uh, of this important style by a renowned architect. So we're always really um, careful to keep an eye on the architecture and how the estate is looking. We have wonderful committees um, with dedicated experts who also advise us um, on what we need to do and how we can continue our, our, our mission of preservation. But we do also try to keep the garden spaces preserved as well. And we've just completed a wonderful restoration of our Arizona garden, our cactus garden. And that was a, a really terrific collaboration with the Garden Club of Santa Barbara. And so it was really wonderful to be able to work with a group who was really invested in bringing that garden back to its original brilliance and just splendor. And so I'm really grateful to them for taking the time and really, really helping us with that space. So we're always working with our committees. We're always trying to, you know, figure out the best way forward to keep everything focused on that mission of preservation. Well, thank you for all you're doing. Um, we've talked a little bit about the spaces and the architecture. One of the things I've heard about are the silver pieces there. Can you tell me about that? So Mr. Stedman, um, as I said, was kind of an artisan silversmith. He took it up later in life and he became really interested in it because he saw an exhibition catalog on silver from an exhibition that happened in London around, it was like the early 1900s. And he just became very fascinated with it. And as I said, you know, Mr. Stedman was kind of like a Renaissance man. And when he became interested in something, he began to meticulously research it so he could figure out all of the components. And so he did that with silver. And so as he began to learn more about it, he began working here in his workshop, creating beautiful silver pieces, goblets, vases, uh, uh, like dinnerware, different things like that. And, and it was really interesting because you know, he had actually a heart condition, so he couldn't do physical activity, but he was so engaged in what he called that sedentary life because he's just sitting, sitting all the time. He would sit probably sometimes as much as eight hours a day working on his silver projects that it really engaged him and it became a passion. And so today, um, we're fortunate to actually have a lot of those pieces here at the Casa. You know, he gave a, a several pieces to, you know, people he loved, his family, his friends. So they're there are pieces still um, in the hands of family members as well, but we do have a nice collection here at the Casa that is on view to people taking the guided tour. So it's really, it's really exciting to have these pieces by his hand because he was actually quite good at it. And it's just this wonderful tangible reminder of what a creative person he was. And it's nice to have that actually that, you know, in addition to the historical legacy, to have this reminder of just how creative he and Carrie both were and having that creative hand still a part of the CASA. So it's neat to have that legacy still here, here at the estate. That's really neat. Um, one of the things we're doing uh, is asking uh, executive directors and those on these interviews, how can the community support you? You know, is it, is it uh, membership? So, you know, what are the ways that, that we can uh, be of support as a community? There's a few ways you can support CASA Del Herrero. One is signing up and taking the guided tour. It's $25. Um, and it's, it's such a great treat. So definitely go to casadelherrero.com to book a tour, but also you can go to the website as well to just make a donation or to become a member. We do have different levels of membership that um, do come with different benefits. So 
you know, you can uh, find out more, read all the details, learn about all of these different options at casadelherrero.com. Great. And do you have a little, a favorite part of the estate, uh, something, uh, something in the garden or what, what's your, your favorite? Well, you know, it's interesting. So when I was in school, I actually studied medieval architecture. And so my favorite thing about Casa del Herrero is the medieval feel huh. that you get when you enter uh, the interior of the house. And it's got these beautiful, you know, thick walls and, and just the, the different types of art that we have in there. It really kind of creates this medieval aesthetic that I love. And so for me, that's actually the favorite thing is walking into the house and just getting that feel, that feeling um, of that medieval quality. So it's something you don't know unless you come and experience it for yourself. But that, that feel is really, really interesting and really exciting for me because I love medieval art and medieval architecture. I could tell, I see the joy on your face and in, in your voice. Um, before we move on to um, the project piece, is there anything else you'd like to tell our audience today? You know, I'm just so glad to be doing this interview today. Uh, for me, Casa del Herrero really is a passion and I'm excited that I'm able to share this passion with everybody today. I think that's wonderful and it truly is a special place. I think that the, the memory of the Stedman family is still very much alive here at the Casa and I think visiting and engaging with us, you really kind of get that feeling of becoming part of the Casa family. So it's a special experience. I'm really happy to be able to share it today. Thank you for having me and for, for doing this interview. It's really, it's wonderful. So thank you for, for everything that you're doing. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. It's been a, been a fascinating journey. Um, and do you have a project for the, the group today? And if so, can you explain it? Yeah, I do. Uh, so the project we're sharing today is an oral history project. So you'll find out more just <laughs> in mere moments. Um, and I think it's really important to continue uh, to engage with our oral histories. You know, all of our families are unique. You know, each one of us carries um, a special memory in our heart or special memories about our families and our family traditions and our family heritages. And I think that's so important. So the project you'll see today is about gathering your family members' histories and hear their stories. So it's really a, an engaging storytelling activity. So hopefully you all enjoy it. Um, I think it's a it's, it's really special and important way to stay engaged and connected to your family. Well, uh, please go ahead and enjoy this activity. George Fox Stedman was a creative individual, the result of which is the beautiful historic house museum we have here called Casa del Herrero. He became especially interested in silversmithing later in life, and we're fortunate today to have several pieces at the Casa by his hand. He started uh, having an interest in silversmithing around 1923, when he came across an exhibition catalog that had works of silver in it from a show that happened in London in the early 1900s. He began looking at the catalog and his interest grew, and from there he began meticulously researching anything he needed to know about the art of, of the silver process. And from there, he, he started working with a renowned silversmith, and then after all of his research and his technique was developed, he came back to Casa del Herrero, where he worked in his workshop, sometimes eight hours a day, trying to, to put together these beautiful pieces of silver. I'm actually standing in his workshop office right now, and just through the door in front of me, is his workshop space where he would spend hours and hours meticulously tapping away, creating these beautiful pieces of silver. I do have some examples here that I can share. This little goblet, this is something he made here at the Casa in his workshop. Now it's a little hard to see the details, but his last name was Stedman, which sounds like Steedman sometimes. And so he really associated with the centaur image. As you may recall, the centaur is half man, half horse, and so he often used this image on things he was creating. And in this little goblet especially, he's placed little centaurs around the top here. So again, maybe a little hard to see, but you get the idea he was creating these beautiful little works of silver, putting very fine details throughout, and also having some imagery on, on his creations as well. Uh, another piece I have for you is this beautiful vase. 
So he was creating goblets, faces, plates. You know, he really did quite a lot of, of, of silver work during the short time he was practicing the art of silversmithing. And this face here you can see has very fine details, kind of like flower imagery. Uh, he often produced these items uh, for family, for friends. He did keep some here at the house and he really enjoyed giving things uh, to the people he cared about. And it's really great because today, in addition to having these tangible pieces, these beautiful works in silver, we also have family members uh, and grandchildren who remember coming to Casa del Herrero. They remember their grandfather and they remember the workshop. And so the works that we have, uh, the context is actually heightened by these wonderful stories that family members have shared as part of Casa del Herrero's legacy. And so what I'd like to talk to you today um, is about an oral history project. You know, oral histories are great because you're actually collecting the stories from the people who live them. And it's getting a collection of stories of a person's life, uh, uh, their family's history, maybe it's family traditions or family uh, legacies. And so it's a really great way to kind of become the keeper of the knowledge of your family's traditions. And so what I would suggest today is as you think about this project, you're going to want to do a couple of things. You'll want to think about the people you want to interview. Do you want to talk to your parents or your grandparents? Uh, maybe there's family friends who remember interesting stories about your family. So really think about the person or the people you'll interview. Once you have that figured out, you'll want to um, really think about the technology you'll want to use because that will really help you collect these stories. So it could be as simple as using a voice recorder, which is something I have here, just to get the conversation on, you know, recorded. Or you can look into other technologies, uh, uh, Skype, FaceTime, you know, Zoom, you know, really find a technology that will work for you. And it's, it's best if the technology can record because you'll be able to record the conversation as well as the face of the person you know, you're interviewing. So once you've figured out your technology, the next thing you'll want to do is really think about the interview questions. Do you want to get a specific moment in time, a specific memory? I would recommend trying not to get the whole history of the person's life in one, sit in one sitting. What you'll probably want to do is think about a specific memory or maybe uh, something very specific that you can then develop some interview questions around and ask that person. Remember, you can always have another conversation with them. You can always continue the conversation you're having, but it's really important to get in there with kind of a specific idea because then it will allow you to be more detailed and gather more information about what you're trying to know. And I would suggest coming up with a theme. You know, maybe you want to think about family traditions or a specific family holiday. Maybe you want to ask about a childhood memory. Maybe you want to find out if the person has any hobbies. You know, there's a lot of different questions or themes you could sort of come up with then to develop your questions. So once you have your theme and once you kind of know the direction the interview will take and you've written your questions, that's when you can call the person up and have that conversation. And it's okay if the conversation moves in different directions or you know, if there's, you know, if it, if you talk about things that you hadn't intended to, that's kind of the nice thing about recording something. You really you don't know where it's going to go. You'll start on one direction and maybe you'll get some really great and interesting pieces of family history along the way. So I would suggest starting on your, you know, with your interview questions, see where the conversation takes you. You can always bring the conversation back around to your questions and you'll have them to make sure you get all the details that you, you, that you wanted. And then once you have that interview done, you can do another one and another one until you've interviewed you know, everybody in your family or that person more than once to really get these detailed histories of your family. And I think what you'll find at the end is that at the end of the day, collecting these stories will give you a really great sense of your own family, your own history, and it will create a really beautiful legacy for those family members to come. So I hope you enjoy this project and I hope you really go out there and, and try to get the, the histories of your family. Thank you. 
Well, that's Jessica Tate, Executive Director of Casa del Herrera. Thank you, Jessica, for being with us today. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. All right. Well, that's another episode of 805 Inspires. I hope you enjoyed this fascinating look inside Casa del Herrero. We'll be back with another episode of 805 Inspires. I'm Eric Davis, Executive Director of TV Santa Barbara. Thank you for watching and good day.